it's a real pleasure to be part of this second session with you and tonight we're going to be looking at peripheral arterial disease management and myths. My name is Gail Curran, I'm a vascular specialist nurse at Northwest Anglia Foundation Trust and for those of you who may not know where that is, it makes up a collection of two large hospitals and several, several smaller um, outpatient facilities around Peterborough and Huntingdonshire. I've been part of the SVN committee for over 10 years and I am the most recent past president. I'm really honoured tonight to be joined by two other excellent SVN colleagues, Siobhan Gorst, who is the current vice president, and um, Victoria Bristow, who's a current conference organiser, and she's also an arterial network colleague. I'm really delighted to be here and have this opportunity to talk about a subject that's very close to my heart, sad as that might be. Um, so as Gail said, I'm the current vice president of the Society of Vascular Nurses, which means that I'll be the next president in November 25. Uh, I'm based at Doncaster and Bassett Law Teaching Hospitals in the People's Republic of South Yorkshire in the north of England, which is a, a small network of hospitals, with one large hospital with three smaller hospitals in the area. Um, everybody on the SVN committee, I'm quite sure, will be fed up with me sprouting. I don't do, I don't care. But I don't. Well, not very much anyway. Uh, and so the peripheral arterial disease side of things is really my bread and butter. That's about all I've got to say about myself. Thank you very much, Siobhan. Um, Vicky, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. My name is Vicky Stay. I'm one of the vascular specialist nurses at Cambridge. Um, Cambridge is one of the largest vascular units um, in the country. Um, and we're the arterial centre um, for Kingston, West Suffolk, um, and um, North, uh, North West Anglia, which includes Peterborough and Huntingdonshire. Um, we work very closely with our podiatry colleagues and our district nurses and uh, primary care colleagues. Um, and I've been a committee member on the Vascular um, Society of Vascular Nurses since 2019. Um, first, I started off as Vascular Matters um, Editor, and I'm now a um, conference organiser for this year, which is our annual conference that's held in November each year. Um, Vascular nurse and I have a real passion for staff education and looking after patients with uh, arterial disease and also managing the complexity of this group of patients. Thanks very much, Bade, and we'll hopefully this evening be able to bust any myths out there with regard to lower limb arterial disease, although I think my colleagues will agree that in terms of myths with arterial disease, I think there's less myths than there are around lower limb care. Um, for arterial disease. It's more about um, the diagnosis of arterial disease and the management of it. Um, as vascular nurses, we see many patients that are referred from the community. Um, so I'm sure you've got lots of questions um, and some of these may be related to why we don't do things for patients, but hopefully we'll be able to answer all of those this evening. Um, right, so I've got a series of questions for you ladies. Um, and firstly, though, I think I'll ask you, uh, Siobhan, um, about what's your definition around peripheral arterial disease? How would you define it? Well, I think that's quite a good place to start, isn't it? And um, like many things recently in, in nursing and medicine, it seems to have recently changed its name. We used to always call it peripheral, peripheral vascular disease or PVD, but more recently it's been known as PAD or peripheral arterial disease. And in some ways, that makes more sense because we actually are just talking about arteries and not the whole vascular system. And when you look around, there are an awful lot of term, there's an awful lot of terms for it, but basically they mainly talk about um, um, a narrowing or blockage of the arteries. And we mainly talk about it in the lower limbs or upper limbs, but actually some definitions expand it to include the renal arteries and carotid arteries, and even some actually talk of what goes far as to say all the blood vessels that exist outside the heart but I think for our for our purposes we really normally mean legs and feet and arms and I think for this uh, webinar we'll be mainly concentrating on legs and feet. Lovely thank you Vic did you want to offer anything more to that definition? Um... So, yeah, so peripheral arterial disease as soon as you mentioned that works for me I just think of it's the collective name for 
the first sclerotic disease within the arteries. Um, and it can go right from the beginning of those patients that are asymptomatic right through the way to the patients that are um, develop chronic limb threat and ischemia. Um, I guess people in the audience might recognise this as previously being called critical limb ischemia. Um, but we're trying to move slowly away from that definition um, as it indicates that these patients often need something done in a timely manner. But it's often the case, but it's not always the case in our comorbid group. We'll move on to discuss that later. And actually, the furinops normally caused by atherosclerotic disease, which is normally a build-up of fat and cholesterol and other stuff which makes a plaque. And um, we know that it's more common in older people, people above 65, although I think we'd probably all agree that notably a lot of our patients are getting younger and younger mm, and it's occurring yeah. at a younger yeah. younger age. Yeah, absolutely. And it affects more men than women usually. Yeah, it's also um, more prevalent in your socio socially deprived areas. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, hopefully we'll answer a question that has already popped up in the chat as well. Um, so if you see a patient, it, it will kind of come after this one. Um, a patient outside the speciality who's got monophasic pulses when you see it when they've seen the patient and they'll often refer to us in um, clinics to be seen. Um, What's your thoughts on that? Do you think that's the, the issue that they need to be referring for at that time, if it's just a monophasic pulse? So, shall I go first? Well, I'll go I'm first, because sure. yeah, it makes it easier. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, like most things, it's, it's not really a yes or no question, and it depends really on a number of things. And first of all, I would never really just consider a Doppler finding in isolation. It will usually be the last. It'll usually be the last thing that I do, really, and it's a, a surprisingly subjective thing. So one person's one phase signal can be another person's biphasic signal, and mm. there have been times when you know I couldn't even find the signal, and then somebody else has walked up and just put a Doppler probe straight on it, and so, which is not really very good for your ego, I can tell you. But anyway, <laughs> that's happened. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not. It's not something that I would just consider on its own. And I would, first of all, always start with taking a, a, a really good history. And I think we'll probably cover that in a little bit. But because if somebody hasn't got any symptoms, then actually it's likely that we'll not be planning any interventional treatment. Um, so perhaps those people might be better cared for by the GP with um, lifestyle modifications. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Vic, let's swap it round a little. Um, they've not used a Doppler because they haven't got access to a Doppler, but they can't feel a pulse. What about that? Do they need to be seen? Should we be referring those patients? I would still always go on a uh, detailed history. Um, a lot of these patients may not have pulses. They may not have pulses in the right anatomical place. Um, you often... Uh, you can often our consultants can't even palpate pulses but I think goes in that history if the patient's completely asymptomatic and they've got not got any pulses they're fine, they're walking about they're actually frail so they can't walk that far so they don't develop into specific medication um, they need to stay in the community and be managed by the best medical therapy Yeah, I think also I think the number is about, there's about 10% of the population where there's an anatomical variance for patients with with um, a loss of foot pulses or no foot pulses. Um, so it's important just to be mindful. And I guess the next thing leads on to from that, you know, what's the important elements about taking that history? You've mentioned a couple of things about, you know, walking distance and things. What do we need to know about? What, what do they need to be telling us when they're referring these patients? I guess the main points we want to know is, um, are they developing intermittent claudication when they're walking? at what distance that is, because if it's short distance, we want to be seeing them. If they're walking two miles and getting to the bottom two miles and they're developing it, they can stay in the community and they could be managed by their GP. Um, we want to be knowing whether they're developing wrist pain at night, which is when they elevate their limb and they get pain rash that tips their toes and they can't, they can't resolve it unless they um, dangle their feet out of bed and need gravity to assist them. Um, 
We also then want more of a, um, if they've got any wounds on the feet and a bit more of a um, past medical history. So actually, have they had vascular surgery before? Have they had intervention before? Are they, are they at risk of um, arterial disease? Have their, all their risk factors been modified? Are they still smoking? Have they been given smoking cessation advice? And also what medications they're on? So I, I always have to take a fairly structured approach to it being old I can't always remember the things unless I do it all in the right order so I, I tend to don't say, say old <laughs> okay be more mature <laughs> I, I, I can't always I can't always guarantee I'll remember things so I tend to stick to the traditional um, history taking structure of your yeah, history of your complaint past medical history drug history social history and exam and one of the things like Vicky was saying is we're particularly interested in the way that people experience pain because that really will give you an awful lot of clues as to whether it's an arterial problem or whether it's something else. And so we're looking at the location of the pain and if it's peripheral arterial disease, it'll be more likely to be in the main muscle masses. Um, whether there's some exacerbating and relieving factors, does it radiate into your back and hips? Does it go away when you stop walking or do you need to sit down and change position and lean on something for it to go away? How long it's been present? Is it getting worse and be or better? Is it worse when you're walking uphill or if you're walking quickly? And then like, risk, like Vic was saying, the risk factors are always important because we know that diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol are all things that can increase the risk of you having peripheral arterial disease. Family history, there's often a, well, not often, but there is can be a little bit of a hereditary component like there is with cardiovascular disease because it's basically the same thing um, with uh, peripheral arterial disease. And also with the social history, specifically smoking. And then last, which can be a little bit more difficult, is if it's a man, I would also ask about erectile dysfunction because that can be a strong indicator of it being um, an arterial disease. Thank you, ladies. Um, so we spoke a bit about walking and um, the the reason why we think about walking and the claudication and the pain that that brings on. Um, so do we worry about those patients? You know, that those are the ones that uh, are sort of been mild, we'd say, wouldn't we? Depending on their claudication distance, but also you did speak about, um, or you mentioned before about alternative diagnosis. So the thing we need to think about and consider as well is spinal stenosis, of course, isn't it? So, yeah, you know. and it's a, it's a funny thing about distance really, because like most things with peripheral arterial disease, it's a very personal thing. So if you are 84 and can only walk 15 yards to the other side of your room, that might be acceptable to you. If you're 60 and a postman, that's not going to be anywhere near acceptable for you. And so as well as being a good diagnostic tool about what's wrong, getting a history about the walking distance gives you an, um, an early indication about whether this person is likely just to need um, a conservative course or whether actually, even though they might not fit in the usual guidelines, whether they might need some intervention. Mm. And it's a very subtle difference, the difference between um, claudication from arterial disease and spinal claudication. But there are some key factors, I always think. So one of them is is that um, if you when you stop walking, if you've got arterial disease, normally you can just stand still and there's a and it'll go away. And there's a very good reason for why that occurs. So um, intermittent claudication, which is the pain that you get when you walk, um, occurs because, as everybody probably understands, your arteries supply the muscles of your leg. And when you're sitting around, your muscles don't really need an awful lot of blood to get to them. But once you start walking and you, your muscles need blood to supply the oxygen for them to work, because there are because people's arteries are narrowed or blocked, then it can't get there quick enough. And so that causes your muscles to have to respire anaerobically, which gives you pain. And then when you stop walking, your muscles go back to not needing very much blood again. And so that pain goes away. Yeah. And that's a very typical, repeatable thing for people with claudication. And some people will say, oh, yeah, I can walk 100 yards. Then I have to stop for two minutes. Then I can walk another 100 yards. And so that's 
if people give that history, it's a very strong indication that it's arterial disease. Mm. When people have spinal cord education, often it's a little bit more equivocal. So what they'll say is, yeah, I can walk 100 yards and then um, I have to sit down or I have mm. to um, lean on something and stretch mm. my back over or, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. And often the pattern of pain is a little bit different. So it's not precisely in the muscles. It's more down like the sides of the legs and if you ever see those patterns of dermatomes on a on a um that you see when you're testing if somebody's got an epidural and things like that then the dermatomes the the pain that people with um spinal claudication often relates to those dermatomes rather than the main muscle masses i think and one I know- of the questions sorry i was just gonna say i think one of the questions i tend to ask patients is is, you know, do you do your own supermarket shop? When you're walking around the supermarket, do you get the pain if you're resting, if you're pushing the trolley? Yeah. Um, and, and we've had some patients that have come, they're keen walkers and they walk with walking poles, they don't get the pain. So it's things like that that you can try to to ask about to draw out the differentials, isn't it, as yeah. well? And I know that I've talked quite, I know that I've talked quite a lot, but I've got a couple of other differentials, if you like. No, go on. Sorry, Vic, what were you going to say? Sorry, Vic. I think I struggle as well when you're trying to um, work out whether it's spinal or arterial and they have both disease processes going on. Yeah. Um, and quite often I say, does it hurt when you're standing, doing the ironing or pushing up? Because quite often they will get that pain when they're standing still if, they're, um, if it's a spinal problem causing the pain rather than arterial. Yeah. And I can't stress it enough that intermittent claudication doesn't occur when you're standing still. Mm. So any pain that people get when they're standing still is an intermittent claudication. Absolutely. There are yes, another. The... Sorry, sorry, I was just going to say in the chat, there's um, somebody's just said, "Vicky, your sound's not very clear. Can you repeat your red? What you said? So we're talking, really, aren't we? Those things like um, I, I'm not sure if she means from. Um, I think a probably factor, to, in, I think it was inter, yeah uh, intermittent claudication. So anything with short distance claudication, um, toes. Uh, Pain in the toes at night when their legs are elevated or any wounds in the foot. I think that was the... Yeah. Um, we, we've got a question with regards to um, medications as well, which kind of comes into the next bit about um, management for these patients. Um, in terms of the claudication, um, I often use, I don't know about you, ladies, but I often refer them to the Circulation Foundation and the infographic on there for the walk, rest, walk cycle. Um, but what else do you, you know, sort of advise in terms of best management for these patients? Well, I think the key thing is, well, not the key thing, but one of the key things is that we know that the best outcome that people will have is the thing that gives them the most benefit with the least risks. And for we know that um, walking doesn't have any risk. So if that works, then that's obviously the best thing. And there is good evidence to show that um, continued exercise will help you build the collateral circulation. So that means that although your motorways are down to one lane or blocked, your A roads and B roads um, will take over the the work and carry the carry the blood down your leg, and the only way to do that is to push yourself and walk past the pain a little bit. And like you say, there's a very good infographic about that on there. Mm, yeah, it's really useful um, about you know patients should go for a a, a um, purposeful walk two to three times a yeah. week for at least half an hour at a time. Um, which, of course, you know, not only improves their collateral circulation, but can add to improving their health in general. Um, and what about medications for these patients? What's the best medical therapy in terms of medications? So we definitely want them on a statin. Um, I know that's one of the contentious subjects with patients is the, the statin. It makes my legs ache. You know, I've already got a leg pain. I don't want any more. Um, but, and even with the cholesterol being normal, they'll still say, well, my cholesterol is normal. Why do I need a statin? Um, and it's about obviously smoothing off them rough plaques. Um, and also I describe it as making their arteries like a frying pan and giving that that nonstick service. So no more atherosclerosis builds up. Yeah. Um, Sorry. We want them on an antiplatelet as well. So 
we would rather them be on clopidogrel, which is, has been proven in multiple studies to be benef more beneficial over aspirin. Um, and yeah, but basically an antiplatelet and a, and a statin is what we would really like them in. Yeah, and there, there is an awful lot, isn't there, in the news about side effects from statins. But actually, there there have been various research studies done that have shown that um, in trials, people who are on a placebo who think they're on a statin have the same side effects in around 90% of cases. And so it suggests that actually some of the side effects aren't a more either caused by other things or because you think that's what a statin is going to do and I think often giving people that one little bit of information actually makes a little bit of difference because mm. most people can tolerate a statin well and if they can't often like Vic was saying you can change the statin change the dose add azetamib if it's not bringing somebody's um, um, cholesterol down and then there are coming along the PCSK9 inhibitors like Eva Lacumab. I'm doing. I'm reading that off a piece of paper because I don't know it by heart. <laughs> which is there's a probably... new study that's going to be coming out, isn't there, with regards to some of the yeah. new drug, newer drugs that can help in terms of cholesterol control. And when it comes to antiplatelets, although um, you know clopidogrel has been proven in some studies to be better than aspirin, if there are an antiplatelet, I'm happy. You know, mm. but there is a risk profile um, associated with aspirin as well so you have to be a bit careful about that and then also, also with clopidogrel you've got those that don't that are not sensitive to clopidogrel yeah. haven't you so yeah and then you've got to consider your ppi so your omeprazole would need to be changed if they're on omeprazole so yeah and then more recently of course there is the well it was a voyager trial but it's known as the compass regime of aspirin with a small dose of river roxaban twice a day which is has been shown to reduce the number of major adverse limb events, I think it is, isn't it? That's so it, yeah. less amputations, yeah. less um, problems. I think, but I think mixed... that's mainly, yeah, I've got to say here, we have fairly mixed views about it. Yeah, and I think it's mainly a, after an a intervention. It was a company-led research study, wasn't it, as well? It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so we have to be very careful, I suppose, in how we interpret those results. But there, there is... I think there's a, a group of people that are still moving towards um, using the 2.5 of rivaroxaban alongside an antiplatelet, isn't there? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, right, in the chat, what have we got as well? A um, person can push the supermarket trolley and also use ski poles without pain. Is that spinal claudication? Yes. So if, if your pain is relieved as you're leaning on something, or using something as a, a crutch, for example, um, it's unlikely to be um, intermittent claudication caused by arterial disease, um, just because you don't get the, the relief in the muscles yeah. that are working. And also, there's a very easy explanation as to why it happens, because when you lean forward over something, I don't know why I'm doing it while I'm sat here, but yeah. you know, when, you, <laughs> when you lean forward over something, it, it opens up that gap between your vertebrae, and so often relieves the the pressure on your spinal cord mm. well or impingement on your spinal cord yeah there's a question here as well about um Vic maybe you can have a, a, a answer for this one so you feel intermittent claudication over a distance for example shopping for example is it a red flag for national wound strategy mild compression so a bit of a contentious one. I mean compression and um ABPIs and low ABPIs were discussed in the previous um, webinar back in May. So there is lots of information on that. Um, but what are your thoughts, Vic, on patients with known PAD and claudication for using mild compression? So I think it goes back on that history taking. If the patient's got claudication, but they've still got a palpable fit pulse, then I would, I would put that compression on. Um, and obviously, it's, it's, you, could, you could do your ABPI um, and test whether the level of the peripheral arterial disease that, you know, if it's um, not, you know, 0 0.8 um, to 1.3, then I wouldn't hesitate about putting any compression on that, even with intermittent medication. Yeah, and if, even if it doesn't give you the whole, um, even if it, it doesn't give you the whole answer. What it does is it gives you a pause for thought. So that person's described claudication. So it means that you should think about whether you're going to put claudication, well, not claudication, whether you think about whether you're going to put compression on or not. It's something that would give you a cause for concern, but might not necessarily stop you from doing it. Yeah. 
And I think also the, there's another question about what do we do with PAD, with, for patients with PAD, but also chronic edema. I think, again, we've kind of answered that in the previous chat in that, you know, you need to get that fluid out of patients' legs to reduce the risk of ulceration. Um, but it's about that full assessment of a patient and whether they're going to tolerate compression or whether it's going to cause further harm. So it's, it's very individual to patients, isn't it? It's, you know, based on your assessment as a, a, as a healthcare practitioner. Yeah. Um, right, let's have a look. What else have we got going on? Um, so this is quite a good answer. And I think uh, a good answer, a good question. Um, a national issue in terms of non-diabetes patient pathway for those seen in community with critical limb ischemia and or sepsis who aren't already undervascular. Is this something that is being looked at to resolve? Currently, pathway is via A&E. Uh, this has its challenges as we have found the need to refer patients again when they haven't been admitted. Um, so this comes from Tracy Wheeler to everyone. So who wants to answer that first? Um, I, can, I can slightly answer it. Okay. I think um, it's a quite a difficult one because actually sending somebody to A&E with critical limb ischemia, they probably will know less about it than you do in A&E, to be fair. And so it's very easy for people to be sent home with some antibiotics for what they think is a is um, an infected wound um, when it's actually critical limb ischemia. And so, um, and I think Tracy's from Doncaster, actually, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, if it's the same, Tracy. And so part of part of the problem is, is that... Um, well, actually, so... Vascular hot clinics, there are a lot of places that have nursed the vascular hot clinics, and they're an excellent place. Yeah, I thought it was. And they're an excellent place to to um, refer patients if people can refer them directly. I think the other thing is um, if you can ring the vascular reg or the vascular consultant on call and say, I think this patient's got critical limb ischemia for A, B, C, D and E reasons, then um, they will hopefully take some interest in that and see them sooner. Okay. Um, Vic, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I think it's just about getting that patient to the right people and that the expertise that are able to make the diagnosis and able to carry out the right forms of imaging um, and get the patient treated. Yeah, I think the important thing is if your patient is unwell, they need to be sent to ED, don't they, to be fully assessed and be started on medical management for, for sepsis control if that's what they've got. Um, and even with centralisation, you do have um, in most non-arterial centres now, there's at least a specialist nurse or visiting consultants that will be able to see the patients or they have direct access to, to call the on-call vascular team at your arterial site to, to get advice and patients be transferred quickly to the appropriate place. So it would be a really Sorry, I'm always interrupting. I can't help myself. That's right. Sorry. <laughs> but it'd be a really great role, wouldn't it, for for like a ACP or nurse specialist to be the person who looks, who, who sees people like that in A and E, to be able to add some some knowledge about what Absolutely. needs to be done. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes they do get sent home if they just present with, you know, a sudden onset of a, a cold pale. Like we had one recently, um, and it was a patient who'd had a previous bypass graft but um, was told it was a venous problem and sent home. Luckily, they'd referred to us and I phoned the patient and we, we got him back in and transferred and or admitted because he'd blocked his graft. Um, so, you know, it is important that patients are seen in the right place. If they don't need immediate admission, then, you know, phone your on-call vascular team or put an urgent referral through to your vascular units for a patient to be seen in a hot clinic. As Siobhan said, I think most places have them now and they're becoming more and more common to see patients within the week, um, at least. So, yeah. Um, well, Tracy, you, Tracy, you can always ring me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, there are loads and loads of questions. There was one about um, change, having to change your PPI from a metprazole to something else if you're on clopidogrel. Um, now, that's because a metprazole inhibits the use, uh, the uptake of clopidogrel, um, and you can use any other PPI, I believe. I don't think any of the others are contraindicated. I think we tend to go to uh, lansoprazole. Um, what do you use? Anything in particular? We, we usually use lansoprazole, but I've got to yeah. say I'm not, I'm not really familiar with the issues. Yeah. I'd have I to admit. Some. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, so there's one about NICE guidelines from Sarah Jarvis. Uh, do you advise to follow the NICE guidelines on the inclusion criteria for vascular referral, or do you think this is not really suitable and needs to be updated? Um, I must admit, for urgent referrals, we use the one from the National Wound Care Strategy, but what do you... Um, I've got to say, we use we use the National Wound Care Strategy one as well, the, the mm. form. Mm. Um so I'm not, I'm not, and I've got to confess, I'm not entirely familiar with what the nice guidelines are for referral. No, I mean we get we get a lot of emails um, and direct telephone call referrals, and we will still accept them. Yeah. Um, if they're going to get give a good history of CRT. And what I would say is that, so we've talked a lot about asymptomatic um, peripheral arterial disease, and I, I, I think we're almost making it sound like that is unimportant but it's not unimportant because we know that having asymptomatic cardio um peripheral arterial disease um needs treatment and it needs treatment with um lifestyle modification and also patients who have claudication we might not always interfere on them but if somebody's got a reasonable reasonable claudication a reasonably short claudication distance then i think most units will be very happy to see them mm -hmm. Uh, this is a good one. Um, does pain in the toes when in bed at night, but no intermittent claudication need a referral? Yeah, please, I would say, refer away. I suppose um, it depends in terms of intermittent claudication. Are they mobile? You know, yeah, yeah they might not be able to walk far enough to get that intermittent claudication. Yeah. So I would prefer pain in the toes at yeah. night. And I'd, all, I'd always prefer to see those people because actually... You might ask people, do you walk very far? And they'll say, yeah, I can walk as far as I want to. But actually, as far as they want to is, I'm, I'm going to use metres because somebody told, spoke about me using yards. It's because I'm quite old. Um, walk 100 metres down the road and um, uh, stopping three times along the way because they're short of breath. Um, yeah. So they might never experience claudication. And actually, to be able, it's, I think it's important if somebody has that, almost red flag sign that we get the opportunity to see them and put a hand on the foot. And I yeah. think as well, it's also at the pace that they walk at. If they're just yeah. doing a little pull along, then they're never going to be using their muscles enough to bring on that intermittent claudication. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a question about um, critical limb ischemia as well. And that was one of the questions I got was, you know, can you break down the abbreviations? You know, you've got CLI, CLTI, or even ALI. Um, what are these, you know, to people who don't work in the vascular world or, you know, we're saying look out for these symptoms, what are they? What do we need to know? So I guess CLI is critical limb ischemia, which we're really trying to move away from now. Um, and we're using the definition of um, chronic limb threatening ischemia. Um, we're kind of moving away from that just because the word critical highlights that something needs to be done urgently. Um, and I guess that's not always the case in every patient and, you know, depending on their comorbidities and, and things. Um, it's, it's always when the, they have wound on their toes for less than less than two weeks um, they get the rest pain and they get the night pain and they're the patients that we really want to be seeing really want to add uh, referrals for um, and then you get the acute limb ischemias which is the ALI and these are the patients that don't have a history of chronic vascular disease so um, they don't really have clash or build up there um, they're people that have suddenly acutely thrombosed the limbs and they are the ones that need A&E straight away because they are the ones where the limbs are at risk Whereas chronic limb threatening in the scheme, I guess we have a little bit more time to um, salvage and revascularize them. And then you also get those people who are a little bit in between with an acute event on top of chronic limb ischemia. Mm. How, how would you expect them to present? Uh, acute on chronic. Yeah, acute on chronic yeah. or your acute limb. What so would you be looking for? an acute limb use is, what is the traditional thing where people talk about the six P's. Um, and so people will present normally in quite extreme pain. Um, they, it, the um, leg will be cold. It will be cool. Well, it will be cold. It will be white. They won't have any um, pulses. They probably won't have any do Doppler signals. Um, and it's um, an absolute emergency. It's kind of a time is tissue emergency. 
it's the thing that the vascular consultant won't mind you waking him up at 2 a.m. in the morning for because it needs something doing now. But actually, you also get some people who have it in a less sort of extreme manner um, where they might have a leg that's marginally threatened but not completely threatened. And that might be because they've not completely occluded the vessel. Or it might be that it's somebody who has got an acute on chronic picture. So it's somebody who's had peripheral arterial disease. So they've developed something of a um, collateral circulation because they've already got intermittent, because they've already got arterial disease. And then something happens where one of the main arteries is blocked. So the leg is still salvageable but probably will be much more painful and, and either the walking distance will be shorter or it will have pushed him into chronic limb-threatening ischemia. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I had a acute and chronic um, patient come in yesterday and he gave a good history of um, suddenly having a long distance, from being a long distance cordicant to suddenly his cordication beginning at 20 yards. So that knew that something had changed and um, he'd acutely occluded his femoral artery. Uh, here you go. What usually comes first, intermittent claudication or night pain? Well, uh, intermittent claudication should al will always come first if it's peripheral, if it's mm. you know chronic peripheral arterial disease. So, and that distance will normally get shorter over time. Although there will be a large percentage of people, and I've, I've written it down because my old brain can't remember it, but now I can't find it. Of the amount of people with vascular disease who will go on to develop. Um, symptoms it's something like 20 percent isn't it 20 to 25 percent yeah it is, yeah. And, yeah and about one percent of those will go on to to experience critical limb ischemia and about 0.2 percent of them will end up with an amputation so mm. actually that's that's actually only quite a small percent I forgot what mm. the question is now what was the question um what what comes first intermittent claudication oh, yeah. or breast pain so it has a very it has a very progressive um, disease. It's have very progressive symptoms, and so it starts off with pain in your muscle masses because blood isn't getting there to provide the muscle oxygen to work. But actually, as it gets more severe, the blood can't actually get down to your toes. Never mind, make your muscles work. And so when you're standing up, it's got the effect of gravity. So often it's you know it might be uncomfortable, or it's not too bad. But at night time, when you're in bed then you've got your feet up, then you haven't even got um, gravity helping the blood get to your toes. Mm -hmm. And so they're the people that you'll often see hanging the leg out of bed at night time. And they often have trouble sleeping because they've got pain at night or they get up and stand at the side of the bed on a cold floor or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you see them when they present in clinic, of course, they've then got edema developing because they've been sleeping yeah, with, with the their leg hanging down or yeah. they're sleeping in chairs yeah. um, because they can't bear being in bed. Um, so the good thing about peripheral arterial disease, it has a very logical progression of symptoms. You can yeah. see at every stage why why what happens happens. Yeah. And you, you were talking some numbers before, and we do have to remember that patients with PAD and critical limbs, um, they're, they're quite an unwell group of patients, aren't they, really? Um, I was with our consultant today who was doing some teaching, and he reminded me that at one year, 20% of these patients will die, 40% percent will be alive but with an amputation and 40 percent will be alive without an amputation so we are really talking quite poorly patients that have poor life expectancy um, and really we need to be rethinking this in terms of palliative care and these patients having chronic conditions that that we're we're intervening on we're not curing their disease yeah and that's something that you always have to get across to patients isn't it that that you yes. aren't curing them you're just alleviating the symptoms absolutely um there's a really good um, point by Robin Calderwood. Um, excellent discussion. Did the panel agree that you are in the position to make the urgent referrals direct to vascular? And do you think this will be accepted by all vascular surgeons? Do you run into problems referring? Well, I don't get, I, I have, I just have direct access and actually people, mm. I get people referred to me. So I, mm. I wouldn't normally need to refer it to a vascular surgeon because I can, I can, plan and do the and arrange the interventions that they do it does become a little bit difficult from <clears throat> the side of people in the community referring to vascular surgeons because actually the there is often not quite as much knowledge out there and so from their point of view to have a lot of referrals that aren't um 
appropriate straight to them is probably it, it feels harsh i know but it's probably not the best use of their time always um but i don't have any problems getting hold of a vascular surgeon for something yeah no i don't i mean i work in a non-arterial center so patients uh, often i'll get a phone call from a gp about some advice or we get phone calls from the wards if i haven't got a consultant on site i take all the details i'll do the assessment of the patient or speak to them over the phone and i'll then phone the on-call consultants in cambridge and they're, they're a, a good group of surgeons that are really accommodating um, and we'll usually see patients and transfer them if if we think it's appropriate um so yeah hopefully that is getting better across the country as well and and you know patients have equitable access to the the treatments and the the teams that they need um there are questions in both the chat and the q a and it's difficult to see both um let me just have a look and see what we've got um again another one about abpi um, showing PAD, does that normally mean that the patient has arterial disease? Would you apply compression? I think the biggest issue here sometimes as well is that elevated ABPI, isn't it, when it comes to PAD? It means that they've got stiff arteries. It's an unreliable reading is basically what it's telling you. Would you like to wind me up and set me off on ABPI? <laughs> <laughs> yes. it's a complete debate on its own isn't it and again I, i'll refer you to the discussion that was online in may because they did cover it in a lot of detail um so it think, is important it's, i think it one of the things to be aware of yeah i think one of the thing one of the key things to say though is that like a doppler signal it shouldn't be taken in isolation yeah. it has to be taken with a good history and a good examination yeah absolutely um with pad can you advise patient to elevate legs or is this bad for them no elevating leg is good it's just that people might find it a bit uncomfortable so um elevating your leg reduces swelling when you've got peripheral arterial disease the last thing you want is something that is making it and this is quite a simplistic explanation because i'm quite simple but um if your leg swells then that means that your arteries are compressed slightly. So it's even more difficult for the blood to get through. So, um, you know, elevating your legs is a very good thing. But if you've got severe peripheral arterial disease, you're probably going to need some fairly strong painkillers to be to enable that, to enable somebody to do that. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes yeah. you need to admit patients, don't you, to, to get them in, into bed with their feet up to try yeah. and aim for some wound healing sometimes uh, as well. And as well for, vas for revascularization we want that swelling down so we want to try and get that yeah. um yeah them less elevated um there's a question from heather chalice i don't know this burger allen exercises to improve blood flow and reduce symptoms i recently read about this and would be keen to hear your views have either of you two heard about this no it was, sounds interesting I'm, I'm... it does yeah yeah, it's something that we need to look at, obviously. Sorry, Heather, I can't answer your question there. I do apologise. Um, let's see, what else have we got? Thoughts on messy and abnormal readings? Again, it's it's not... Messy shouldn't be used now outside of research practice. That came out of a nice recommendation, didn't it? Was it last year or was it this year now? Last, I, think, I, think, I think it was last year, I think, because yeah. I, I mentioned it in my debate last year. Yeah, yeah. But I am... Um, I, it, it's funny, isn't it? Because, you know, you would think that anything that makes things easier for people would be better. But actually, I think it, as well as the fact that it's sometimes not correct, and, you know, I get a lot of referrals on the basis of an obviously automated ABPI. They're often, they're really often not very accurate. They don't promote an understanding of what you're doing at all, because a lot of them don't even give you a figure. It's like PAD, not PAD and or severe PAD and it kind of I don't know it kind of takes you out of thinking about what it is that you're doing and again you know you still need to be taking a, a, a good history putting your hand on a foot because although people aren't experienced at feeling pulses if you can feel a pulse and you can count it you can feel a pulse and doing it more and more often will improve the reliability of you doing it. 
And nobody's completely reliable about feeling pulses. You can put your hand on it, where you can't feel the pulse. And again, have somebody walk up behind you and completely feel it. So, you know, there is no shame mm. in not being able to feel a pulse and then somebody else being able to feel it. It's just all about learning to become more competent at it and trusting what you feel. Because if you can count a pulse, then you can feel it. Yeah. So... Would you be able to summarise the patient problems you would prefer not to be referred to a vascular clinic? Um, I, I could say the, the um, teaching I was on today was with our vascular consultant who was teaching some GPs and he used the Rutherford classification in terms of that. And uh, or when I spoke to another consultant, he was saying that anybody with Rutherford of mild to moderate, we don't necessarily need to see. Um, there's a link that can be put into the chat in terms of the Rutherford classification. Um, but it's those with, from, sorry, ladies, I'm taking here, you know, sort of no, that's very the... short distance, disabling claudication, tissue loss, and yeah. pain. Um, I mean, would you all agree? Yeah, there has to be yeah. anybody. We don't want to see that asymptomatic and their long distance claudicants. They can yeah. be managed in the community and by the GP very well. They should be, shouldn't they? And also, they should all have access really to an exercise and claudication clinic, which unfortunately isn't well funded yeah. across the UK, obviously. But it is the same sort of exercise therapy that, that should be available that they get for cardiac rehab. Um, so, and I know yeah, it's in some nice guidelines as well. Yeah. yeah. Nice and then, I mean, there's very good evidence. There's very good evidence to show that compliance is much better in supervised exercise programs. Yeah. But I, you know, when you talk to almost anybody, very few people actually have them. Yeah. I mean, there are there are telephone apps and things like that, aren't they? That that people can use to have a more structured approach to their um, exercise. Yeah. Yeah, we have tried using telephone apps, but um, it's very GPS orientated yeah. so actually sometimes it was it was very inaccurate and in how far the patients were actually walking yeah um so i just saw in the chat there's somebody saying is it um is it okay to use a doppler to um listen to pulses so actually if you're using a doppler it's signals that you're listening to i use that all the time that's what that's my major method of assessment really i very rarely do an abpi but you do have to familiarize yourself with the different sounds of, you know, monophasic, biphasic and triphasic. And again, it's a very subjective thing. So I would never take that on its own, only with a really good history. Yeah. I think as I someone said about toe pressures, I'm kind of moving from APIs to actually doing toe pressures because I find that they're a lot more accurate than the API. And they often um, you don't get the calcification readings because they don't affect the vascular search yeah. circulation yeah not as yeah. much do they and we just take absolute pressures when we do it we don't we yeah don't I do. we just look at the absolute pressures um so yeah um so uh let's have a look um long distance claudication what distance is long distance and when does it become short distance i'm okay with yards or meters i guess that again is very individual to patients isn't it because we talk it's, about long distance and short distance but it's what's debilitating to the patient really isn't it i mean yeah i mean we had a man who we intervened on who's actually his claudication distance was about half a mile but his job was to walk along the side of a train at various points to do something and he couldn't do that with a claudication distance of half a mile and so um you know for him an intervention was a sensible thing because he was walking all day every day so it got as good as it was yeah and um you know he couldn't do his job he's still a person of working age so we always have to think about the that these things are a very individual thing yeah um Vic, did you have anything else to add on that? No, I think it's yeah. very on the patients. Um, yeah. you, know, you, you get the patients that um, just want to be able to walk around Tesco's and they're happy, um, and you get the ones that actually want to be able to do more. But obviously we do. Uh, we would still want to do a bit of unsupervised exercise mm -hmm. um, and see them again and click just to see if we can get them walking further before we do any intervention. Yeah. Um, as, as intervention we can we can cause problems and yeah and, and that, that's what that's what I was going to sorry that was the thing I was going to say as well is that um 
having an angioplasty is actually a fairly comorbid so, sort of a procedure. We do lots and lots of them, and there are very, very, very rarely any problems. But when there are problems, they can be absolutely Perfect, catastrophic. Yeah. yeah. And um, I've been in the situation of consenting a lady for angio and counselling about having her angio, who then who was kind of like a 300-yard claudicant, but absolutely determined who then did go on to lose a leg as a result of it, something that went wrong with the angio. And so you always have to keep these things in mind when you're, when you're thinking about what an intervention is. And I'm always very, I'm, I kind of do the old undersell over deliver thing. Mm. And I'm always quite, well, very honest about what could go wrong if you have an angiogram or angioplasty. Yeah, yeah and I, th- I think you do. Once I always say to the patients, once you have an antipasti, you you are on this slippery slope that you then require more intervention. You then require a, a stent in, a bypass, and then a major amputation. And when you when you actually talk to the patients about that, they are keen to you know do as much medical therapy and avoid uh, revascularization when possible. And it's really important, isn't it, as well in this group of patients to talk to them about smoking cessation. We've not mentioned that yet this evening, Um, but it's so important for this group of patients because, of course, if you go on to do intervention and they continue to smoke, they increase their risk of further complications um, and increase their risk of things not working, but also continue that disease development and disease progression. So, you know... Mm -hmm. What what do you use in terms of smoking cessation for your patients? Or what do you offer? So we have a we have a great um, team. They're called Healthy Living um, or Healthy You, and they're for um, patients in East East Anglia or Cambridge and Cambridge and West Suffolk. And they have a spe- specialist dedicated smoking cessation team. Um, and I, I point them exact exactly to them because they know smoking cessation better than me. I'm going to cut you short on that. There's a really good question, and we're going to have to start winding up now. Um, but Claire Dunn asks, can you explain RUBA in relation to PAD? Sure. Yeah, do, you, do you mean to go? So yeah. ischemic RUBA um, tends to occur, well, you can see it very, um, very, you can see it very obviously in Berger's sign. So people who have um, severe, severe ischemia, what happens is, is that if you put, if you put the leg up, it goes quite pale, and all that time, your little arteries and your big arteries are opening up as much as they possibly can to get what limited blood they can get to him. So they're doing absolutely everything they can to get all the blood to it because they're really struggling. And then when you put your foot down, the same thing's happening. So your your little arteries and things are. Uh, open as far as they possibly can to get as much blood as they possibly can but now the legs down so actually they get some blood so that fills all those little arteries up and turns your foot absolutely bright red and that's you you commonly see that with people who've got severe ischemia when the foot is down but it normally only occurs in fairly severe ischemia thank you Siobhan uh Vic can you answer this one? Once angioplasty completed, should a patient go back to vascular before considering compression if wounds present for follow-up before any ABPI be completed in the community? Um, I guess it's, it's dependent on that patient. Um, so I think if they had have an and if their arterial disease was bad enough for an angioplasty, um, we would want to see them before commencing compression. Um, and we would probably want to do a toe pressure and see what the benefit of that angioplasty has been um, and whether it was successful or not. Sometimes, um, even with our IR colleagues, they're, they're unable to open up or access um, any more vessels. I think the key thing as well is if, if somebody's got normal sensation, normal cognition, then if they're not suitable for compression, they're going to tell you much before anybody else notices it because it'll be really uncomfortable. So, you know. Um, and we've mentioned it as absolute pressure for the, the TBI or ankle pressure. Um, what is absolute pressure? And I suppose we get so used to using these terms, don't we, that we don't think about, you know, whether others understand it. Um, Siobhan, can you explain? Well, so what we use as an, as an absolute pressure is... Um, we basically use systolic blood pressure as an absolute pressure. We don't normally bother 
turning it into an ABPI. Yeah, yeah. so it's just so what, that actual reading, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So effectively, it means you've got 80 millimetres of mercury of, um, you know, putting, uh, getting down to your foot or to where yeah. you put the Doppler. Yeah. Um, and is vascular claudication usually bilateral? Um, it's often unilateral, isn't it? But it can yeah. be bilateral. Uh, you you often see patients, don't you, that, that come because one leg's bothering them um, or they've got problems. And then when you've treated that leg and those symptoms have improved and they're improving their walking distance, the other yeah. leg starts to be problematic. Well, I guess um, if it's bilateral, we're, we're more worried about if it's bilateral buttock claudication because then we're more worried that it's going to be um, the sclerosis within the aorta. Yeah, yeah. Um, lots and lots of questions again about ABPIs, pulses and things like that. I think the important thing to remember, if you agree, ladies, is that it's about the symptoms. It's about the patient's symptoms, not yeah. just the readings. It's your full assessment, your risk factors um, and what is that patient presenting with that you're going to be um, referring it for. Um, and the other thing is, if you're referring somebody and you can you can speak about all those things with some confidence, you know, say, you know, that they haven't got foot pulses, they've got monophasic Doppler signals, these are the symptoms, then actually your referrals will be taken much more seriously. Mm -hmm. There was a question earlier as well, and I, I was going to um, put this one out. Uh, it was, uh, oh, where is it? A non-NHS, um, do, 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 where is it gone? Foot, foot health practitioner outside the NHS, um, how can they best help? client access and help in investigation if they have symptoms this was from Alison Connolly I'm not entirely sure how the private system um, connects with the NHS but I would think here at least we'd be happy to have referrals from either a private service mm. or an NHS service yeah yeah so yeah um, and if there are problems, then just get the GP, just um, get the yeah. patient to report to the GP and, and tell the GP and ask them to refer. But they sh most vascular units, if it's a, if it's a critical limb or a, a critical limb throbbing ischemia or symptoms that you're worried about, most of them will see and offer advice, won't they? Um, yeah, and some, somebody did just put in the chat to feel popliteal and femoral pulses too. And I, I completely agree with that, but yeah. it's kind of a... Um, that's probably a little bit of a step on unless you're more comfortable with it. Okay, we are at 7.29, ladies. Would you believe how quickly that hour I can't believe how gone? quickly that went. Um, we've touched on loads of areas of managing the leg um, here or, you know, understanding peripheral arterial disease. I'd like to say a huge thank you to you both um, for your time this evening. It's been lovely sitting here having a chat with you. It has been like a sofa chat, really. 